I read, I read stories and I read them every day where a company or an organization or a politician or somebody uh, says in a story where they didn't respond to the request for an interview. And I just think that's completely inexcusable uh, from a communication standpoint and uh, from, from the standpoint of someone running, running a business or, or running a company. The responsibility and benefits of having professional relationships with media and the communities who support your organization are more important now than ever before. And it takes someone who has worked both sides of the media microphone to understand how to work those relationships. In this episode, Steve McAllister explains how building relationships throughout his career proved to be a benefit to himself and the organizations that he served. Stay tuned to hear how journalism principles affect both the reporter and the communicator when it comes to telling your organization's story. Here on Speaking of Media, the podcast where communicators and the media come together to consider the world of mass storytelling. I'm Keith Marnock, former journalist turned corporate communicator. And I'm hoping that you, as someone who speaks on behalf of your organization, will join me for each episode to learn about tangible ways to share your stories and messages, and also, perhaps as importantly, how to avoid getting caught in a negative media storm. Steve McAllister quickly translated early success in the community newspaper business into a formidable sports journalism career with the Canadian press. Before moving into the communications field at the NHL Players Association, and before that at Tennis Canada, where we first met and worked together. As a former online sports editor at the Globe and Mail and Yahoo Sports, Steve believes the days of high budget, personality driven print journalism have perhaps disappeared. But his comfort in dealing with community partners and media alike was a basis for his success both as a journalist and as a corporate communicator. Steve recently wrapped up his latest comms posting at Bruce Power in Kincardine, Ontario, where he now lives. I spoke to Steve from his home via Zoom. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome to Speaking of Media podcast, Mr. Steve McAllister. Steve, who joins us from uh, Kincardine, Ontario, uh, in the depths of winter. Uh, How are we surviving uh, this winter, Steve? Well, I wouldn't say, Keith, I've, I've been in Concord in the past when you really could say the depths of winter and, and uh, it had a true vibe to it. But uh, COVID aside, we've, we've escaped relatively um, you know, scot-free in terms of uh, the, the weather being warm so far this winter. And uh, to be honest, I kind of miss it. There aren't a lot of opportunities to skate, uh, to skate outdoors. Uh, we haven't enough snow to do really any snowshoeing or skiing out here. So I... I think we could certainly use a little bit more cold and a little bit more snow. Well, we certainly appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, you're really uh, one of our one of our early guests on the podcast here is we really start to build our audience and uh, somebody who was high on my list to uh, that I wanted to talk to uh, within the podcast here. Uh, you're someone who has really excelled on both sides of the media microphone, as I like to say, uh, both as a journalist uh, and then taking your skills um, from from those days uh, and and applying them in corporate settings uh, in some pretty high profile um, in some pretty ho- profile um, roles. So I really appreciate taking the time. And what we wanted to do uh, within the podcast was to talk a little bit about the state of, uh, of of journalism, the communications and the communicators who support journalism and storytelling for their organizations. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the kind of um, skills that communicators should be uh, looking to, to be building on these days? Uh, the environment is always changing, always evolving, but uh, I think there's probably base skills and, and there's maybe some new skills that people should be really concentrating on in this sort of this new time for journalism and communication. Yeah, absolutely. Key. I mean, Flexibility has to be at the top of the list. And again, you look at the career path that you've taken and the different hats that you've worn. And in my case as well, I mean, I think, um, you know, when I went to journalism school as a, as an 18 year old and back way, way back in 1978, I mean, my dream was to one day cover the Toronto Maple Leafs or, or, you know, be a, be a sports writer. And, um, you sit here four decades later and, and you see the way the world has changed. I mean, uh, there were obviously no cell phones back in 1981. There was nothing called the World Wide Web. Um, you know, there weren't even computers back then. I mean, I, I um, uh, you know, we, at 
journalist Squirt Ryerson, you type your stories on a typewriter back then, you, and if you made a mistake, you got the whiteout, and if you got the whiteout out and then made your change that way. So uh, it's a, it's a, there's been so much evolution in, in the industry, um, but there's still some basic principles. I mean, I think at the top of that list is relationships. And, uh, you know, we could probably spend two podcasts just talking about how the relationships that I've, I've um, had over 40 years in the industry have helped me along my career path and, and also allowed me to do, uh, to do my job to, you know, what I, I think is a fairly high, uh, fairly high level. Um, I've done some teaching at schools. I always tell, tell my students that write, you have to be able to write. And even if you want to be an on-air personality, if you want to be Bob McCown or you want to be Bob McKenzie or you want to be James Duffy uh, or you want to be a producer like a, like a Paul Graham at TSN, you still have to be able to you have to be able to write. Um, that's that's the principle that I think is really uh, really important. Um, and then I think just the, being being read. I've always told students like read as much as you can and and. I think, Keith, that we, we have more exposure than ever, and although we've seen some doors shut in some aspects of the media business, um, we see the strength of social media now in a good way, and social media has certainly been trashed quite a bit lately, but, um, you know, I look at LinkedIn, and I, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn during the week now and, and get so much great information from going there, and uh, you know, there's more books being read than, than ever. There's still good, really good magazines out there, and it's just a lot of good reading on online. So I would I would encourage um, young communications people uh, that you can. Uh, there's a wealth of information available out there, and, and you, you need to be well read. It's great for it's great to, for people to hear that who are journalists or writers at heart as well. There's also markets to actually continue to be uh, writing and producing journalism on a, on a broader scale uh, beyond sort of a, a 15 or 20 second soundbite as well. So. I guess the other big um, new element that we deal with these days is social media. And it's not so new, but uh, the reality is that um, it does affect so many parts of communicating, uh, whether, you're, whether you're trying to represent or, um, I suppose, balance the relationship around trying to, to, to communicate on behalf of an organization, especially, uh, or if you're trying to use it as a, as a communication tool uh, uh, to you know, to, I guess, invested audiences or targeted audiences that are really already bought into uh, what it is you're doing. Um, speak to us a little bit about, uh, you know, your thoughts around social media and um, where it's taken us and, and what we might need to consider moving forward uh, with that being a real reality. Yeah, I, I would say, Keith, that I, I think uh, it probably is not long ago that, that companies looked at social media and they hired some young guy out of school because they knew how to work a camera and, and uh, you know, it was that there was, we went through a phase, it was all about churning out content. And um, I think it's a little more sophisticated now. And I, and I also think those young people, they're, they're more highly valued and more highly respected. And people realize how much value social media and, and good, good social media content can bring to a company now. Um, I'll give you a, Perfect example. I think for me, the last two years, especially the last year of Bruce Power and with the COVID pandemic, um, social media became really important for Bruce Power. Um, I, I think reputationally, because um, we were we were taking a bit of a hit when COVID first struck, and we we have a lot. We have six thousand people that work at Bruce Power up here, just, just north of King Garden, and uh, there was a feeling that we weren't being nimble enough and and you know getting workers properly uh, outfitted or, or, or trying to cut back on some of the work we were doing to take proper precautions against the pandemic. And I think um, and James Gagnac, who is our executive vice president of corporate affairs and operational services, he, he deserves a lot of credit for this. He, right away, we got very involved with the community and we, we donated about, over the course of three or four months, half a million dollars to food banks for the support of our supply chain. Um, we, uh, you know, we announced the, early in April, the premier report on a, on a radio show in Owen Sound with our president and CEO, Mike Renchak, that we were, uh, we were going to donate 250,000 pieces of, uh, protective personal equipment right away. And, and since then we've donated, I think it's over two and a half million pieces of PPE, uh, over the life of the pandemic. And I think social media really gave us a chance to, um, 
to tap into our audience and, and let them know that we were uh, let them know that we were doing we were being community leaders. And, and Bruce Power probably in a normal year would spend over two million dollars on sponsoring sports teams and organizations and national programs like the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Um, and I think I thought social media gave us a chance to really reflect our, our status as a, as a community, a good community citizen. Um, and at the same time, we, we've done work very closely with the Gray Bruce Public Health Unit where uh, going back to March, and we've probably done about five or six of these things now, we, we hosted virtual town halls with Dr. Ian Era, who's the chief medical officer for the health unit up here, and uh, had, that, had that broadcasted on radio stations across Western Ontario and help get that information out to people in the communities about, about protecting themselves against COVID. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I mean, that's a great, those are all great examples of how community relations can really drive certainly positive uh, or promotional type uh, communications. Uh, how about on the, on, the, um, on the more critical side? So social media, as a, uh, you're saying you felt uh, the pressure in the early days of the, of the pandemic. Um, how much credence do you put into social media? I'm sure our audience would be really curious as to your approach to how you sort of feel or um, provide criteria against social media to determine, um, you know, how or if you move forward with something uh, when you're when you're sensing resistance or, uh, I guess, identifying issues uh, that you may not otherwise been aware of. Yeah, it's a good good question. I mean, I think. The one thing that social media can do, Keith, is it can amplify your voice and amplify the, the vision and the mission of your company and your values. And I think uh, the one thing we we weren't, I would say Bruce Parr probably wasn't as proactive as it should have been on social media um, for, di for different reasons until the pandemic uh, came along. And I think the one thing that, that uh, I tried to bring to our social media accounts, and especially on Twitter and Facebook, is that um, you know, we have a real connection with the community. So things like, um, you know, sharing, sharing tweets or sharing social media posts by, by local councils or, or local companies or the public health units or the, or the firefighters or, uh, you know, we, we, um, we sponsor Wounded Warriors Canada. Just basic things like sharing their tweets, I think, is an extension of those sponsorship programs. And it shows them. Um, it shows the people around us that Bruce Power doesn't just write a check for somebody and just, you know, figure that they've done their duty. There's a real connection and attachment to these organizations. And, and I, I think the response to that has been really overwhelming. And um, it also allows us to tap into different audiences, audiences too. Like most of the resistance that we got at the beginning of the pandemic was from on Facebook, where we have a lot of, um, a lot of former employees and, as you know, Facebook is a bit of an aging aging audience, and that's where we were getting much, a lot of pushback. And we were able to speak directly to that audience. I think that's one thing that's really important about social media. It can't just be copy and paste, where you take up a picture or a video clip or a graphic and use the same words on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. It has to be it's very specific to each of those social social media channels. So I, I think um, the one thing the pandemic allowed us to do is it really is it's almost, um, and again, this might might not be the right phrase, but it, it does feel to me that we, Bruce Power has more of a human face because of what we have done in, in COVID. And I think we've been able to reflect that Bruce Power is more than a company. It's a, it's a 6,000 employees on our, on our social media network. It's, it's, it's great. And I, I uh, you know, I, I've seen that and I applaud what, uh, what's been done in the community up there. And uh, it's such a big part of the community in terms of being uh, basically the major employer, uh, certainly in the Bruce, Bruce County side of, of, uh, of the area up there. So it's, uh, it's really good. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, successful media relationships. So the relations generally, as we're talking about uh, great insights there. Um, you come from a pretty um, active personal sports background, as well as a, a great, uh, great experience in sports media. Um, and, and I guess there are pe people who would argue that uh, dealing with a sports reporter is maybe different than dealing with a consumer reporter or sort of a, um, uh, you know, a bulldog reporter on the investigative front or whatever. Um, any hints or um, uh, insights into trying to build solid media relationships with frontline reporters and editors? Yeah, I think 
you know, our, our relationship with a reporter, Keith, or, or an editor is really no different than a relationship you have with a spouse or with a, with a child or, or a friend. I mean, there has to be a mutual trust there and there has to be, be some give and take. And it can't always be you as a communications person calling a reporter and expecting him, to, him or her to write, write a story that you, that you pitch. Um, and there, I think trust is, is critical. And uh, I, I know you, you want to get into off the record a little bit. And I think there are times that once you build that relationship, that's where you can have those off the record conversations because there is, there is a mutual trust. And, and you understand that by providing reporters some, some background where you're not being quoted and, and uh, uh, they have that trust that you're giving them the straight goods, that that's going to help them with their, their story. And it's going to, going to help uh, yourself with, with the uh, with the image or, or the point of, of that story that you want to get across to to your company's audience. So um, the relationship things are very important, and I would say from a career standpoint, Keith. I mean, we're, we live in a we live in a time where uh, the days are long gone where someone's going to work for company X for 35 years. I mean, most of us. I think I've worked at 10 different places in my career. Um, if you had said that 30 years ago, you would say, well, geez, that's Steve McAllister. He can't hold a job. Um, I'd like to think that you look at 2021 and you say, geez, you know, Steve McAllister had a pretty, pretty neat career and, and work that had some pretty great gigs. Um, and I think that that's what the mindset of a young person should be now is that, you know, even if they happen to get in at the ground level with Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment out of, out of school, um, they probably don't want to be there 25 years from now, uh, with the very, very rarest of exceptions. Uh, do you go looking for reporters to have those relationships with, or do they do they become obvious who those reporters need to be that you have sort of closer, ongoing contact with? Yeah, I think that again it depends. Like obviously you. You and I uh, both worked at Tennis Canada, so in those days, you, you obviously it was important to have a good relationship with someone like Tom Tebbit, who was writing on tennis on a regular basis for the for the Globe and Mail. And and when the uh, what's known as the Roger Cup tournaments now were were in Toronto, you wanted to make sure that you had a good relationship with with the Jim Van Horn at TSN and, and Peter Burwash, who was doing color commentary, or or Tracy Austin uh, to have those relationships where you could pitch pitch them ideas and, and, uh, you know, use that, use that relationship to, to both, uh, to, to really the benefit of tennis camp, but also for the people watching, watching the Rogers cup on, on TSN as well. Um, and I, I think probably it's just a little bit organic too, Keith, where you just, uh, you, you click with a, with a reporter that there's a trust factor there and a likability factor. Um, and I think, you know, but you do have to respect people. Like I remember when I worked at the NHLPA, um, Larry Brooks, who still covers hockey for the New York Post, Larry was, was very anti-NHLPA during the lockout in 1994, and and um, uh, you know was kind of spinning what what Gary Batman wanted to spin, and uh, you know didn't have a lot of use for what what uh, the, the players' association had to say during during collective bargaining. Uh, but I would take Larry's phone call every time. And, and even when the lockout ended, he and I would, we would talk on the phone for half an hour some days. And we might have, have a debate about, uh, about free agency or, or, you know, Larry might have something that he didn't like the players were doing. But Larry was a guy that I could have an open and honest conversation with. And we might not, we might, I know we didn't always like what each other had to say, but at least the respect was there. And, and I know that Larry would write a more informed column because he, I'd given him the opportunity to speak speak with uh, with me about the players' association side on the issue. Yeah, I feel like you know uh, more junior, or, uh, you know, mid range communicators. If that's who we're talking to in this podcast, they really under, need to understand that a professional, if not difficult, uh, conversation or issues that they're dealing with, if you bring professionalism to the fore. Um, it's amazing uh, the relationships that you can develop. And like you say, they sometimes go well beyond the, uh, the story or the issue um, of the day. I'm, I'm always trying to push the idea that, especially now in sort of a social media era, uh, there's got to be an effort to try to be more authentic and more open uh, to the point that makes sense for your organization. But uh, certainly shutting down uh, has never worked very well. And I think nowadays um, it's maybe even more damaging if you go down that route. You know, one of my pet peeves 
these days, and we were talking before the podcast, Keith, is, you know, once upon a time, no, no comment for me was, was inexcusable. Like, I would never, ever, as a media relations person, be quoted in a story as saying no comment. I mean, if I, if I couldn't say something, I would, I would tell, explain that to the person, or I would try my damnedest to, to get back to them with some kind of a comment. Uh, but we've gone we've gone downhill now to the point where I've seen it more and more. Uh, where uh, I read I read stories and I read them every day where a company or an organization or a politician or somebody uh, says in a story where they didn't respond to the request for an interview. And I just think that's completely inexcusable uh, from a communication standpoint. And uh, from from the standpoint of someone running running a business or, or running a company, and um, I'll tell you, when I worked at the NHLPA, one of the one of the most important, if not the most important, thing I did during the lockout of 1994, which was really 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 busy. Um, this was before cell phones, but um, I would walk around the office every day with with a stack of pink slips, and it was messages that were taken for me to call back reporters. And I wouldn't leave the office or I wouldn't go to bed at night till every one of those phone calls had been returned. Even if it was a case where I called Keith Marnick from the Newark Times Ledger and said, you know, Keith, I just, I, there's nothing going on today. I have nothing to report. Because as far as I was concerned, that's part of the job. And I don't think that's, that's changed or should have changed since 19, 1994. So that's, that's a big issue for me. And I, yeah, if you're a young communications person, you want to build relationships. You've got to be willing to, to return a phone call or return an email, both in good times and bad. I think I'm always trying to uh, impress upon communicators that you need to be able to uh, anticipate uh, issues that are going to cause you concerns, issues, maybe crises, uh, and really be prepared for those whenever. And that um, just because something isn't talked about on a particular day, if you know it's an issue or uh, it's an environment where something's happening that's it's bound to happen or to be picked up as a story that you need to be ready to uh, you need to be ready to be, to respond uh, depending, you know, who knows how the, how it's going to come out eventually or what the uh, scenario might be, but that preparation around things that you can foresee uh, is really important. Yeah, well, that's a great point, Keith. And it, it comes back to the reading again. And, and uh, something that I've done as long as I work communications, I used to spend the first, uh, half hour, hour of my morning when I'm having my coffee and I log on to my computer is going through what media websites and and going through Twitter feeds to see what's what's out there. I think to your your point about you know being able to react when you get that email from a reporter, there's no reason why you can't get back to that reporter right away and say what's your deadline on this story. So again, because as we both know, reporters they they use Twitter now. Their their content or their copy is not just appearing in a newspaper or on a newscast, it, it could appear on Twitter right away as well. So if you react right away and say, what time do you need this by? And then uh, if it's five o'clock, then you you know what the timeline is and you, you tell them, okay, well, I'll, I'll get, don't worry, I'll get back to you by before five o'clock. And then it's really incumbent on the communications person to talk to the people that need to talk to and, and make sure they just let, deliver on that, uh, on that promise. But I think that will kind of help you in terms of, you know, the worst thing is if you don't respond and all of a sudden so-and-so puts on Twitter that they, uh, they sent you an email four hours ago and they're still waiting for a response. I mean, to me, that's, uh, that's the ultimate embarrassment as a communications person. Uh, I always say that it's great, you know, to have our own social media channels, but um, the strength of the media carries on because as a third party or as a, uh, as, a, as a separate party from from uh, from the audiences, I guess that you control, uh, media perspective and media uh, commentary on what it is that you're doing uh, still matters. And um, you know, again, I think a lot of communicators can find themselves in in difficult situations. That's part of the profession, and being able to deliver good messages outside the organization is one thing, but also being able to speak truth to power and to be able to you know, represent back what it means not to um, not to uh, communicate well uh, to people who are hesitant within the organizations is a it's a tricky part of uh, of journalism and of communications. And you know, it's really where your metal is tested when it comes to being a professional. Yeah, I think Keith, that's one of the areas where, um, for some reason, I don't know if you've seen this, but I I worked for some very very smart people, some of the smartest people around, and yet they're totally scared of the media. 
And I, I just don't understand that. I mean, if you're, if, if you're in, a, uh, in an executive position, if you're a president, CEO, or if you're a vice president, or you're an executive director, uh, you, you're very well equipped to deal with tough questions from a reporter. I mean, I, people like you and I can help. Um, we can help manage that to some point. But authentic, you're, you're right. Authentic is the right word, is that you want, uh, you want to be truthful when you talk to a reporter. You want to provide as much information as you can. You know, sometimes you do need to educate educate reporters, and also you have to you have to prioritize. If you're if you have someone who's covering the nuclear beat or whatever beat, the education beat or whatever it is on a daily basis, you absolutely need to have a, a mutual respect and a great relationship with that person uh, because you are going to deal with them every day. Uh, on the other hand, doesn't mean that you ignore the other people because again. You and I, we come from, I, I think, Keith, like, uh, like myself, you, you started uh, your career at a, at a small, uh, small newspaper, or a small radio station. And boy, oh boy, like I've, come, I've covered a lot of uh, high school athletes and, and uh, rubbed elbows with a lot of people in my profession who started at, you know, small, small town papers or radio stations or TV stations. And they're, uh, they're some of the most influential, influential media people or executives on the planet now. It's, it's amazing who you meet along, along the way, and, and those relationships will ultimately help you down the road. Just sort of on a broader scale, uh, you're stepping away sort of from formal work. I sense you're going to keep having a, a, a finger or a hand in, in, in writing and communicating uh, uh, moving forward. But um, when you look at the, the, um, the state of, of journalism, uh, both locally and more, you know, in a more global sense, um, just some of your impressions these days. Uh, my sense is that more and more um, um, the biases or the angles of particular outlets is really becoming far more defined. Uh, everybody kind of retreating back into their own corner. I don't see that as being necessarily good, but I think that there's probably hope for um, up and coming communicators and journalists to uh, to step into those roles and try to reverse what I find to be some pretty um, troubling trends. Yeah, I think I think the scales have tilted the wrong way in terms of opinion versus reporting, Keith. I think um, you know, and again, I get it. In, in a digital world, it's all about eyeballs and that. But if you go to the front pages of a lot of digital uh, media outlets today, uh, the lead story is a column, some some you know inflammatory column that someone's written. Um, I'll tell you, when I worked at the Globe and Mail, I was there from 2000 to, to right before the end of 2009, and and um, I mean, the Globe was considered uh, and always has been a conservative new newspaper, but I, I never heard those guys say, hey, let's, how are we going to screw the liberals today to our, to our uh, Parliament Hill correspondent? I, I equate what's happened with the decline in, in the, the number of reporters. It's kind of like going into a grocery store. I go into the Sobeys store in King Carden, I uh, go to the vegetable section, and there's either no lettuce or the lettuce is brown. I'm not going to buy that product. And it's going to get to the point if I if all I get is brown lettuce or no lettuce every time I go to Sobeys, I'm not going to go to Sobeys any longer. You know, newspapers wonder why they're they're failing. It's because the, the product's not there because there's not enough staff. And and I'm really passionate about local journalism, Keith. I I think um, if we don't have weekly newspapers and weekly radio stations and and local television stations, uh, there's no one to hold uh, the decision makers uh, accountable in, in, in our communities. And I think, um, you know, it's going to be, that, that's going to be trouble. Um, that's, that's just not a good scenario. My sense, and uh, as we're looking like we're moving more directly into a, sort of a more of a pandemic posture, um, that more and more uh, mid-range and smaller size companies are investing now in communications. The, the need wasn't always there especially those who are business to business uh, who don't necessarily have a big uh, public uh, presence or whatever. Um, just your impression generally of, of what communications needs to be um, bringing to organizations, you know, whether it's, it's private or, or public uh, in, in their, in their makeup, the value that communications departments and personnel bring to um, the running of a successful organization or, or company. Yeah, I, I think it's Keith. It's just it's key to uh, it's key to shining a light on a company, on on the business, on the people, on what they do, on what what they stand for. Um, you know, I'm actually glad. Like I'm, 
just thrills me to see to go on LinkedIn every day and see the number of communications jobs that are out there right now across all levels because it's it is an important function, and in my sense is that uh, companies have finally realized that having communications and marketing as one, you know, one department or having a community, it never made sense to me to see a job for a communications and marketing manager or a communications and marketing director, uh, because for me, those are two completely different, uh, two, two completely different fields of expertise. Um, and I, so I do, I do think, you know, you, you have to have communications people who can work, work with their executives to make sure that they can properly uh, convey their message. And, and again, something as simple as teaching executives how to speak to a reporter, um, because we don't, we, we don't see, tend to see a lot of that with small and medium, uh, medium companies. And we need to, we need to help those executives, really smart executives get out, be able to get beyond that fear factor and, and be able to deal with the media. And I think the other thing, Keith, is I think it's really important if I, if I have a company today, I, I've got some kind of a social media, you have to have a strong social media person who, who uh, knows, either knows how to tell stories or can work closely with that communications person and use the different tools there are to make sure that you're effectively telling those stories about your business. Well, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, um, I, again, it's, uh, it's something that's not really news to us, but something that I think uh, we're seeing more and more of a buy into when it comes to uh, companies that weren't necessarily previously investing in that. When you look back on your career, when I look back at where our careers um, sort of crossed, I mean, we were pretty lucky people. We were able to uh, uh, get involved with sectors and get behind the scenes of places that we had real passions for. And um, what do you say to people who are uh, perhaps in journalism, but more likely heading towards a, a communications career? Yeah, I, I still really think Keith, that you can, you can have successful careers. You're absolutely right. I think for, I, I tell people a lot now, um, especially over the past year that I, I really feel like I'm part of that last, generation of, of sports media people who were lucky to have to be working in the business at a time where, you know, they were still really uh, extravagant, maybe not the right word, but we, we had extensive travel budgets. I mean, I, I had a million dollar travel budget as, as sports at the Globe and Mail. And I feel lucky in that regard, but I also think there's a lot of opportunities out there. I, I see a lot of young reporters who are, are doing their own podcasts and, and, um, you know, I think Steve Dangle at Sportsnet is a great example. And here's a guy who was doing videos out of his basement, putting them on YouTube. And uh, that, that was not long ago. And now the guy's turned into one of, I think, one of the most influential hockey personalities in, in Canada. So I think the one benefit that today's young people have that you and I didn't, Keith, is there, there are, you know, the YouTubes and Instagrams and TikToks and, and LinkedIn's and podcasting and, and they for those people, they've kind of replaced the Concord News and the, the Georgetown Independent and CKBR Radio and Barry and CKNX and Wingham. Um, so there are opportunities to, to cut your teeth um, going down a different path. But I think if you're passionate about something that, there, you know, there, there are lots of jobs out there. And I would say too, it doesn't have to be in communications. I mean, there are a lot of people who, who might start in communications who end up one day uh, you know, being being a vice president of hockey operations, there are a lot of opportunities out there, and I would I would say don't you know don't box yourself in, don't uh, don't say that if you you know if you if you can't be a city hall reporter, the Toronto Star, you're you know you're never going to work in journalism. Well, I hate uh, categorizing us as old timers, but it's certainly um, fun. We are. <laughs> we are. It's certainly fun and uh, great to, you know, be in an environment where we can uh, connect like this. Steve, I really want to thank you for your time. You're always very gracious with it. Uh, you've always got great stories and great, great examples to uh, paint the, the communications picture for us out there. Um, it's always great to talk to you. I look forward to some uh, warmer weather where we can maybe uh, connect again uh, in the links uh, in Bruce County. Uh, I love doing that. And um uh, I want to thank you for uh, all the work you've done during your career, but I know that you're very, very generous with your time and your experience with not just the people here on the podcast today, but um, in, in all in all areas of, of communication. And so um, 
Uh, and I'm also hopeful that uh, despite the retirement tag uh, that you carry on and keep, um, you know, uh, contributing as you do uh, locally and more broadly to, uh, to communications. And I know the sports, uh, the sports community loves you as well. And so, uh, again, thanks a lot for being on the show today. Thanks, you. Look, I appreciate that. And uh, it's fantastic that you're doing this speaking and media podcast. I think that, uh, you know, someone with your background and, and the relationships that you have that can bring guests on this show is, uh, is definitely something that's going to help uh, young communications people. And I look forward to going on LinkedIn one day and seeing someone say, you know, thanks to Keith Marnick. I'm now, I'm now in a senior communications role somewhere. So I, I really appreciate you having me on the podcast. Outstanding. Thanks so much, Steve. Thank you. And so there you have an educated frontline impression of media coverage and media relations from someone who has seen the business from a national and international viewpoint, but one that was also very much rooted in small town beginnings and values in a career that has proven to be a tremendous success. Our thanks again to Steve McAllister. As we have considered in other episodes, the ideals of being authentic and open to media connection continued in this show. These days you simply cannot avoid media scrutiny, but you and your leaders don't need to fear that scrutiny either, especially if you have a great story to tell. When it comes to building media relationships and also reaching out to connect with those who are either in close geographical proximity or those who hold similar values, it is never too early to build strategic and sensible partnerships. We hope to keep bringing you the best in the business from both sides of the media microphone who will help you better develop and deliver your messages and stories. If you have a suggestion for a topic or guest, we would love to hear from you. Drop us a comment here or inside our Speaking of Media Communicators discussion group on Facebook. And wherever you find your podcasts, I hope you will continue to listen, like, comment and subscribe to Speaking of Media, as that will help us expand our show's reach and attract quality content. You can now listen to Speaking of Media on YouTube Just search our name. You'll also find us on Instagram, LinkedIn under my profile, and on Twitter at Media Speaking. I'm Keith Barnock, and through other episodes, I look forward to the next time when we will be speaking of media.